I think um, there are a few things in this world that make us feel as bad as when something unfair has been done to us. I've learned this a lot about myself over the last couple of years that um, I am very much um, enraged when I see something unjust happening to me. And you might feel this way as well. You might feel like your blood begins to boil, that your, sin, your skin becomes uncomfortable with maybe in your hands are a little bit clammy. Maybe your mind, like mine, begins to shrink and narrow. I think when we have this feeling of injustice, where we feel like something unjust has happened to us, we feel enraged. We feel we need to speak out to right this wrong that has been done to us. But my Christian friends, what happens when there's nothing that you can say or do to right the wrong? And you just have to accept what's happened. It's hard, I think, to not be angry at injustice, especially when it's done to us. And easily, our, our feelings of injustice can turn to blind outrage because we can't make sense of what has been done to us and we feel deeply hurt that there is nothing we can do about it. But I think as Christians, this never needs to be our position in life. But yes, we will face injustice in the world. Yes, sometime that injustice will turn into physical suffering, but never are we blinded of the reality of life, never without knowing what we should do, and never are we without help from God above. We live in a world that is blinded by rage against injustice because injustice makes people feel powerless, small, helpless in all their situations. But I hope one thing we realize this morning after this message is preached is that we as Christians don't need to have rage against injustice. Rather, what we need is faith. And we don't need to see injustice as just a hopeless experience where there's nothing that we can do. But rather, we can realize that these are opportunities to demonstrate our faith if only we have the right perspective. And this is the perspective of Paul this morning. This is the message you're going to hear this morning that the author, the Apostle Peter, is going to tell us about how we can make the most out of our suffering and, and experience of, for being a Christian. And this is what you will hear. Christians receive divine favor by their endurance of in, uh, in, injustice and suffering. And by doing so, they testify to the work of Jesus Christ in their lives. I love this book, and I spent weeks seeding the idea of preaching in this book to Pastor Kevin. Whenever we would talk about what book we would do next, he'd be like, have you thought about First Peter? And he'd be like, oh, okay, sure, let me think about it. He'd talk to other people, and he'd come around again, and he'd ask again, you know, maybe what book should we do? And I'm like, let's do First Peter. And he's like, okay. And finally, he agreed. And the reason why this book is so impactful for me is because it speaks to a specific reality that I, thought, I, th I think we both agree that we wanted to talk about in the church today. And that's the, this idea of being exiles and sojourners in the world around us. This is what Peter is interested in. He's interested in this question of we as Christians, especially these Christians in Asia Minor where this letter is directed to, they currently live in this oppressive state where they are being persecuted for their faith. And there's a reminder in this letter that this is normative because they are not, they're not of this world. They are aliens and strangers in this world today. Now, in this section of scripture that we see, his goal is to not just remind us of this reality of that we are sojourners and aliens, but also what this should mean for us to live in this world. And he says this about the section, that, which prefaces the rest of what we're talking about this week. Verse 11, verse 12. Behold, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct amongst the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds, and they glorify your God in the day of visitation. <clears throat> 
Peter's admonition here for us has three specific components to it as we see ourselves as these aliens in this world today. Firstly, that while we are on earth, we should abstain from our sinful passions. Secondly, to keep our conduct among the Gentiles honorable and righteous. Number three, that as we keep our conduct righteous, the goal is that so that people could see our lives, the way that God has transformed us and is working in us, and that God would work in them to bring them to faith so that they can glorify him. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because this is all important for the message that we're talking about today because we're talking about Christians who are slaves and they're called to submit to these unjust masters. And this is all going to preface this idea. Let's start with verses 18 to 20. So verses 18 to 20, it says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure. But if when you do good and suffer for it, if you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Maybe just a, a note of consideration here. That I would say that before we start talking about this topic, we need to understand that the Bible is not pro-slavery, and neither is the goal of the Christians of the first century to make these social revolutionaries. As my favorite theologian, Thomas Schreiner, writes, he says that slavery is not something that Christians commend, per se. Slavery is not a biblical institution or part of the created order of the world. It is just simply something that God himself has not put in place. But at the same time, Christians are actually also not freedom fighters. Their goal was not to take down the social structures of the world around them in the first century. Firstly, because I think if they tried to, they were so small that the Roman government would probably erase them from the face of the earth. But I think the main reason why they did not do this is because they were focused on two specific tasks that were given to them. Number one, they were focused on bringing people to Christ. And number two, to live godly lives. So as you read this, I really hope that this is something you understand, that we're not trying to um, speak about slavery as something that we should be doing today or something that Christians should be taking part in. Rather, this was just a cultural reality, a social reality of the Roman world. But Peter uses this concept of this social construct, this social structure, to teach us something about how God desires for us to live in this world. And specifically, he outlines this by saying slaves are to live godly, honorable lives in this situation by submitting and showing reverence and respect to their masters, even if that master was unjust. I think um, Christianity must have been a really appealing option for slaves in the first century. Because as Peter writes earlier in the letter is that Christians are free people. Now, this Christian freedom is a little bit different than what you think about. When you think, think about freedom, you're thinking about, I'm free to do good or do bad, to do whatever I want. But Christian freedom is actually something very different than that. Christian freedom means that you have been freed from sin, and now you're free to serve the Lord. Now, this idea of freedom, actually, freedom for slaves is actually... It conflicts with the Roman idea of slavery in so many different ways. Firstly, slaves are seen as people who had very little agency or choice in their lives. And secondly, slaves are seen as those people who worship their masters in the way they serve them. And this is why Christianity was, I think, so appealing to them, because it completely changes the outlook of what it meant for them to be a slave. Because at this point of time, it means that their goals, it means that they have actually real choices in their life, choices that have a higher meaning or purpose. And secondly, that their worship was not actually to a master, especially one who was unjust and treated them badly, but it was actually to a God who had loved them and saved them. And I think why Peter writes this section of scripture is to clarify to people about what they should be doing. Because you can imagine 
If you became a Christian and you were enslaved to this evil person, you could very much maybe say, oh, clearly God does not want this. How could he ever want me to be enslaved to this person? How could this be right? And yet Peter actually says to them, don't disregard your masters. Don't speak ill of them, even if they are unjust people. Now, this might be really daunting for us because how could this be, right? Respect should be something that is earned, not given. But I think we need to understand that what Peter is doing here, he's actually changing the nature and identity of the work of their service. Firstly, because here, when we, we start to change the paradigm of this world, is that for slaves, they no longer are worshiping, they're not, they're, they're not worshiping their master, or neither are they following their master because of his worthiness, but they're doing so because God is calling them to service. So the paradigm is not that he is worthy, that he is worthy of receiving my service, not worthy of the things that I'm doing for him. No, rather, it is God who is telling them that this is a service to me that you're doing on behalf of me. Secondly, it changes the nature of their work. The work for a servant here is not just simply to satisfy the whims of their superior, rather their goal is to satisfy God's calling for them. And the big idea here is that actually what this means is that servants or slaves here actually had real choices that they had to make. That as their masters commanded them to do something, they really had to think about the question about, should I do it or not? Is this something that I need to do that pleases God? Is it something that God desires, so I'm going to do it? But it also could mean that my masters asked me to do something evil, I need to refrain. Now you can imagine, once this paradigm shifts, something now happens in the relationship between master and servant. And this could cause the master to actually punish unjustly their servant here. They might punish them for doing the right thing that Christ requires of them, or not doing the wrong thing that their, their master so desired. Now, their punishment might, might even be more, more general than that. It might just be because they're a slave. It might just be because they're a Christian. But whatever it is, this is God's calling for them, that they need to be subject to respect their masters. But they do so because God has a deeper and more meaningful purpose in their work. Now, there's one last thing here that he includes about why they should do this. It's not simply that if you endure this suffering, then that means that there's a proof that you really truly save, that you truly receive grace. In fact, he says that if you endure, there's a reward that awaits you. Peter speaks of this idea of this gracious thing that I think is better defined as divine favor or blessing or divine reward from God. And I take this interpretation because there are a couple of textual reasons, but this word credit in verse 19 seems to point to this idea that they are doing something that God is rewarding them for. And I don't think that's surprising. The way they live has bearing upon the, their life. The way they suffer has effects. And here it speaks of how God sees what they are doing and is rewarding them for something that they are being unjustly, for something they were unjustly receiving. And so this was the, the calling that God had for this specific household group about how they were to deal in the world that they were in. He sets the expectation for them about how they are to live, how they are to be. But I think it's important here that we notice that this is actually not just for them. There's a deeper question for us here today, even though that we are not under this social group or this particular group. Because we too are Christians that have suffering or injustice that happens to us. And so here's a question that we need to ask. Do we think that we, ob that we can obey God and submit and respect to our superiors even if we go through injustice and suffering in this life?
that's different now, right? It's easy when we put it in an arm's length away, when it's other people who have to suffer, other people who have to deal with hardship. It's much harder when we start thinking about how it relates to us today. Now, I want to be very clear here. What I'm, I'm not talking about is I'm not saying that there isn't a place that we should fight injustice in our own lives or personal injustice in our own lives. In fact, I think that we really should fight that personal injustice in our own lives. And in our Western context today, we actually have many avenues and legal ways in which we can resolve injustice from people who wish to harm us. We actually see this in the Bible as well. In the Old Testament, in the, 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 the minor prophets, or in the book of Isaiah or Jeremiah, talks about this idea of God's people are to do justice, to seek justice, to correct oppression, and to bring justice. Furthermore, in the New Testament, we can see that Paul stands up for his personal rights in Acts chapter 22 when he is unjustly flogged. So I want to make very clear here that what, we're, what I'm talking about today is not that you can't fight injustice. What I am saying today, though, is that because you're a Christian this morning, and even though you have all of these avenues of, of ways that you can deal with injustice today, because you live in a fallen world that is hostile to you, you will still face injustice and suffering. And there will be many times in your life, I think, where there will be no recourse about, the, about how, to, how to deal with the situation. You might be put into situations where people just don't like you for who you are because you're a Christian. Maybe it's going to cost you a promotion. Maybe people will speak ill of you because of the things that you believe. Maybe someone is going to persecute you for something that you did that was good. Maybe someone will persecute you for something you didn't do because you think it's bad. I've heard so many stories from many of you as we've been talking over the last couple of years about different ways in which you've experienced this injustice in your own fields. People in the health profession, people in the law profession, people who just work labor jobs or work in retail. And many of you have experienced situations where you had a chance to represent your faith and you were told to stand down on something you believe. This is something that I think is becoming more and more normative in our world today. We actually saw this last year with an, a number of professional athlete, athletes who were Christians who basically either did something that was good, that was related to their faith, or they refused to do something that they thought was bad, that was against their faith. And this caused a huge firestorm in the media where at least one of these people were fired from, from their profession. I'm telling you this because I think that all of us will run into these unjust situations and I wonder how many of you feel trapped, that there are no ways out, that I have to do what my boss tells me, I have to do what my superiors tell me because they are the boss. If I don't do it, they're going to fire me. But you really should know that you have a choice as well. You have a choice to do good, you have a choice to do bad. You have a choice to worship your boss or your superiors, or you have a choice to worship God. But just like those in the first century who are the lowest on the political, social totem pole, servants or slaves to masters, if they had choice to do good and bad and receive injustice for it, you and I too have that same choice. But we, should, we also should know that if you're going into a field that has a lot of conflicts with the Christian faith and its beliefs, you're going to find people, I think, probably more and more, maybe your superiors, who, are going to try, who might try to harm your career, your mental stability, your reputation, and maybe more. And I tell you this not because I want to scare you into leaving your, your field of expertise or running away from school. I tell you this because I think this honestly is going to happen. And it's important that we are ready for the realities of what might come. But here, I would say that Peter tells us these things not to scare us as well. Peter is telling us these things because it gives us a powerful lens and plan of action to understand and how we should execute in situations. 
He's telling us these things so that we are ready and prepared as we deal with these injustices, and not just to, to flake or be scared or be powerless, but to know that God has this plan, that there is this lens in which God sees what you are doing, and that we are to act in this way because we know what our Creator is like. Now the question is, what is this, um, what is this, what is this lens? What is this plan? Why do we need to suffer? And this is all covered in the preceding passages, starting with verse 21. Verse 21, for this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you examples so that you might follow in his footsteps. One of the craziest things that I've heard, and I think it's true, is that suffering in the Christian life is not just, it not, doesn't just indirectly happen. Right? It's not like, just because you're a Christian, you're just like in an odd angle and it aligns incorrectly, and so therefore you kind of run into something and it happens by accident. No, Peter actually has a deeper idea of why we struggle, why we deal with injustice, and he's actually saying that you are called, that God is calling you to suffering. It's crazy, right? How can that be? How can a God who loves me, a God who saved me, wants me to suffer? And I think the reason is because we think of suffering all backwards. Suffering for us today means hardship. Suffering means sacrifice, compromise. It means we've lost out in something. But suffering in the first century was something they actually looked forward to. Isn't that crazy? If you read the letters of Paul, especially in the book of Philippians, he says, I look to suffer like Christ suffered. Now, where this comes from is we often use this word, I want to be like Christ, right? And if I was to take a poll this morning and ask you, how many of you want to be like Christ? I think all the Christians would put your hands up. Great. But did you know in the first century, when they say, I want to be like Christ, includes, I want to suffer like Christ. Who's in? Who wants that? So honest, Josh. It's a hard reality. But it's a reality that God has called us as Christians to because the reality of suffering actually is something that God uses for his good pleasure. And he uses it also to bless you and me today. Something we've already talked about in the way that God calls the, these, these slaves to suffer is that they are going to receive a, a divine reward or divine favor for doing it. And so when God calling you to suffer, he is working in you. He's being there with you. He's working through you to fight through this suffering so that you can receive this blessing from him. I wonder how many of us here have seen this suffering on the horizon in our own life. You can see that clearly. If I say this in a either job interview, if I say this at work, if I say this to my coworker, I already know, I don't know if this is going to go well. I've done this at work before. And I'm sad to say that I was a Christian when this happened, but I was in this conversation with somebody in my workplace, and I, and I remember distinctly remembering, if I talk about my faith right here, I'm not quite sure if I'm going to keep this job. I was under probation, I think it was at the five-month mark. I was barely on the border. And I remember just asking myself, ah. you know, if I lie here, I actually can control the outcome of what's going to happen. I wonder how many of us do that, that we actually look at suffering as something that we want to completely avoid and completely forget that we are actually called to suffer and God can use that for, for his good pleasure. But here's the second reason. The second reason why we are called to suffer is so that we could be like Christ. We already talked this morning about every Christian's sole desire is to be like Jesus Christ. But as we just said, that to be like him requires us, demands of us, that we should suffer like he suffers. Now that doesn't mean that all of us here in the next 40 or 50 years are going to be put up on a cross and crucified. But what it does mean is that we're going to experience some level of suffering for the faith that we have. And so the question is, we are now called then, if we are to suffer this way, that we're called to, to, to respond to this suffering like Christ responded to the suffering. And this is what it says in verse 22 to 23, that Christ suffered by not 
uh, sorry, Christ lived through this suffering by not committing any sin. Neither was he deceitful, found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued to entrust himself to him who judges. Peter takes these images of suffering from this earlier passage in Isaiah 53 that we heard this morning, that this suffering servant suffers in this horrific, terrible way, and yet even though he suffers in this way, he does not sin a single time. What is your suffering like? When you go to work, when you're with people who are above you, when you share your faith and you know that something's happened and, you're, and you know that that suffering is coming down the road because you know that they're not going to agree with you, what is your approach to this suffering? And do you stand against yourself because you want to rage, you want to attack, you want to hurt this other person before they hurt you? But you know that this is not what Christ wants from you because we are to be like him that we too are to commit no sin in our suffering, to speak no deceit, to have no harsh criticism or abusive language to those around us, and to not to threaten other people. Is this the way that we suffer? Here's my last reason. Earlier when we read verse 12, it tells us that your life your suffering, the evil that's done to you, God is using as a testimony and testifies to the salvation that is in your life. Let me remind you again, verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. When people look at your life, and if your life was a book, and it, it read out all the things that were happening and was responding correctly to how you were receiving life, could people see Christ in you as you suffer? Does your life radiate the glory and wonder of Christ, the way in which he suffers and lives and loves? Is your life a testimony of God's work in your life that when people see you, can they glorify God? Could they even see God in you at all? Because that is one of the reasons why we suffer. One of the reasons why we go through difficulty. One of the things that you get to learn as you get older is that talk is cheap. I think we all know this, right? I think you probably don't need to be very old to know this idea. And when people see you, you can say all the things in the world. And there are probably people you've met that you've tried to share the gospel with, but it, it enters on deaf ears until the moment they see the, the time, the moment they see your faith is being real. And that moment tends to be when you go through suffering or difficulty. When people see that, it makes their eyes change. It makes their thoughts change about you because now it's not just talk. Now it's real in their life. So is your faith real to you when you go through injustice and suffering as well? Now, I gave you the reason why, uh, why we suffer, and I think that, I hope that out of all of this, what we've talked about, that what you've come away with is as Christians, when we suffer, we can be hopeful. Not because we're crazy, because we think that we love to suffer, no, but because we think our suffering has purpose and meaning. And that if we continue in this way, God promises us a divine favor or his blessing when these things happen, even when it's hard. This is very different than the reality of the world today. A reality where the world's constantly lamenting of the problem of hierarchies and the injustice of evil people in these hierarchies that deal with them directly. And I've met so many people in the world who are not Christians that when they deal with the evil injustice they face, they're never right again. They can never go back to work in the same way. They feel powerless and betrayed but this is not you or me. Because you and I have something greater and deeper and has purpose and meaning that changes all the things in which we do. And this is why, just as Christ can do in verse 23, 
that we can entrust ourselves to God who judges justly. Let me just quickly read for you verses 23 to 25. But continue entrusting himself, Jesus Christ continue to entrust himself who judges, uh, to him who judges, judges justly. He himself bore our sin in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like, like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your soul. Another way that we can imitate Jesus is the way that he entrusted himself to God. Jesus entrusted his entire fate to God, even though he was being attacked, even though people were casting aspersions and lies against him, even though the people were about to take his life. And even through all of that, he put his, his life in the hands of God, who he trusts, who he knows, judges correctly. We too should have that same entrusting. Firstly, we, should, we, should, we can have this entrusting because of the salvation which Christ has won for us. For us, for us as Christians, we know that Jesus Christ came and died for our sins and that anyone who believes upon him may have eternal life in him. And this salvation that which he has won for us, which he has given to us, has freed us from sin so now that we can live righteously. So if Jesus can do all of that, if his plan was this great just for you, that he would do all of this for you, how much more can you trust him this morning? The second reason, the second reason is the one that really struck me this morning, is that Jesus is the shepherd and overseer of our souls. When we talked about this idea of suffering this morning and injustice of, for being a Christian, did you know that God is there with you? He's always there with you. He walks with you. He suffers alongside with you. He's bearing witness to all the events that are happening. And it is amazing to know a God that lives so closely to us this morning, a God who, who struggles with us, who loves in such a way. When I think about what we're talking about this morning, I think about Psalm, like Psalm 23, verses 1 to 4. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall, not be, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He, he restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of shadow and death, I fear no evil, for you are with me, because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Is this how you see your life? Because I think that this entire idea of God being with us actually empowers our ability to suffer and to endure suffering and in, in injustice in our lives today. Because God is watching us, he is guiding us, and he's our guardian. And ultimately, nothing is outside of his vision or gentle care. And it is only this kind of person, this kind of God, this kind of Savior that gives us any courage to live this kind of life. It is only a God who is with us that we can dare to live in injustice. I think we all know this to be true because we all have parents. My dad was the, the one who taught me how to ride a bike. And up to that point where I had learned when I was like up to seven, I was, I was riding this really weird bike that had um, these kind of like training wheels on the side. And we all know that that's not true riding of a bike, right? We don't call that really riding of a bike. I just couldn't get the balance of the pedals and the balance of the bike quite right. And I thought my dad would be angry at me because I couldn't get it, but, but instead my dad stayed there with me. And him just being there gave me courage, courage to fail, courage to fall, and courage finally to ultimately ride this bike. It's funny, I see the same thing in my daughter. I have a, I have a young three-year-old daughter right now. Her name is Constance. She's pretty funny. And I see it when I spend time with her and doing things with her that she has courage as well. Uh, one of the things that we had courage was with this is there's this park near our house that has this little weird tube. And it, it, whoever, whoever did it is, 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 I think, probably very sadistic. Because basically, it's this little tube that basically is for, like, it's like a rock climbing tube. 
And it's meant for kids, but clearly it's meant for advanced kids, right, who have really good climbing skills. Because at the end of climbing that tube, my kid was covered in bruises and scrapes. But she did it. She did it because we, me and Hannah, were there to cheer her on. We encouraged her to go up. And she made multiple attempts climbing up and up and over that place. And I think the goal that I'm trying to tell you is that when there's somebody who loves you like that, that stands there with you, it gives you courage to fight through this kind of suffering. This last section here where it tells you that God is, Jesus Christ is your shepherd and the overseer of your soul tells you that he's watching, that he struggles there with us. And that because he is with us, we can walk through the valley of death, that we can handle this injustice because nothing is out of his hands. We are in his care. We walk behind him. He walks alongside us. He leads us wherever he goes. So this is the God that you have. Now it begs the hard questions this morning that we have to think about. What does your suffering say? Does your suffering tell you these three things, that you trust and love him who watches over you? That you're like him in your suffering and you're expectant of a final reward? Does your suffering testify to the work of God in your life and when others see how you live, that they could give glory to your, to your Father in heaven. This is what suffering is meant for. This is what injustice is meant for. Now, it's very clear today that this is an undesirable reality, right? We really just don't like to suffer as Christians. It's just not pleasant. We don't control the outcomes. We don't know how it's going to go. It's just not fun. And oftentimes, it can be quite harmful. But I hope this week, as you think about what it means to be a Christian, to get, spend a little time, bit of time thinking about why would God allow us to suffer? And if you come to the same conclusion as I do, that it's for his glory, can you do it? Can you suffer for the sake of Christ? Amen. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and... Uh,